My name is Gideon Lowe, and this is my colleague, Naranjan Sarvi. And uh, welcome to our session today on implementing PII encryption with PDX serialization. Quick question, does anyone here not know what PII stands for? OK, well, uh, personally identifiable information. So it's that stuff in your data that you want to make sure is never exposed outside your firm. So let's look at uh, a few of the trends over the last few years. According to uh, breachlevelindex.com, there were over 1.3 billion data records stolen in 2017. And that's up 68 million on the year before. Two thirds of those were with, with malicious intent. And in the last five years, uh, only 4% of breaches were secure breaches. And those were cases where the data was encrypted and thus um, wasn't exposed, even though it may have been stolen. Uh, Forrester Group reports that over half of global network security decision makers have reported at least one breach in the last 12 months. And Kaspersky Lab reports that 31% of data security breaches lead to firing of employees. So let's get this problem solved. <laughs> um, certainly something worth looking into. So we're going to dive right in. Um, here are the features of the solution we're proposing for uh, PI encryption based on PDX. So uh, with this solution, we're encrypting data uh, in the geode cluster on disk, in memory, and in transit or on the network between components. So it kind of covers all the bases. Um, all of the encryption and decryption happens on the geode client uh, or the app server that's a geode client. And the server never actually handles or gets to see unencrypted data. Uh, we retain the ability to search for, um, for the data if it's uh, based on an encrypted PII field, so long as that's a uh, key-based lookup or an equality uh, predicate in an OQL query. We are attempting to minimize the performance impact here overall and minimize impact to existing application logic as well. Um, and to try to make it easy to integrate with key management tools. Let's see. No. OK, let's look at some of the fundamentals of this. Um, as I'd already mentioned, but it's important to repeat, uh, that's uh, encryption, serial, the uh, serialization logic that includes encryption is only on the client side. So again, the servers uh, never see unencrypted data and never have uh, the tools to actually unencrypt data. Um, our logic encrypts each field individually, replacing an original string value with a base64 encrypted string. And uh, we actually prepend a short character sequence to each encrypted byte array, um, which is used as a, a migration tool. So that's something we're going to follow up with, and I'm kind of giving you a little taste of that. But basically means that on the outbound path, Logic can check to see if this tag is present and thus know kind of dynamically whether it has to decrypt the value or whether this funky looking string is actually the way it's meant to be. Um, we, uh, the deserialization logic kind of reads the encrypted string field from an inbound PDX byte array, decrypts the value, and just assigns it to the uh, end user Projo. And we, we enable this via Java annotations. So, um, you can just designate your PII field with annotations on the Pojo class, and that can drive this customized behavior. OK. Um, so I want to emphasize how amazingly simple this pattern is. Um, and to do that, I'm going to look at some PDX uh, serialization logic. And this is how you would write PDX code by hand. Now, not many people do that. <laughs> And in fact, we use the um, reflection-based auto-serializer in the example we'll dive into here. But logically, it is very much the same as what we see here. So if we look at the before, very straightforward, right? Uh, your two-data method uh, passes in your, your object to be serialized. You can cast that to the appropriate type. And then write each field out to the PDX writer one by one with the appropriate uh, utility method. Deserialization, very simple. You, know, you get a PDX reader and uh, the class that that represents. And then you can new up a new instance of that class and then assign the fields one by one as you read them off the, the PDX reader. 
So the only change we have to make here in order to uh, add our encryption to these PII fields is as we write the object, we're going to embed a call to our encryptor bead to encrypt it. And similarly, on the way back, we're going to embed a call, embed a call to decrypt uh, the, the uh, encrypted field. Very straightforward. And what do you think, is this all there is? Well, actually, pretty much. It's a powerful pattern for not much work. Um, but we've done a little, made it a little bit fancier and more useful than having to hand code it. So let's move forward. So um, I mentioned an encryption service. So we encapsulate the encryption uh, functionality within a, uh, within a bean. So it does not actually use the Geode API itself. Um, everything's encapsulated in a class we'll call iCrypto service. The initialization logic is responsible for obtaining an encryption key. Um, so this may be injected somehow, or in a production implementation we've already had, uh, there was a vault server, and it reached out and got the key from the vault. Um, there are only two public methods on this, just encrypt with a string and decrypt with a string. Again, very simple. Um, we, we provide the option to load any cipher that's available through the Java cryptography extensions. So uh, we use the JCE, and that kind of handles any variance in regulation, international regulatory structure or issues like that. And we wire this in as a singleton spring bean. Let's take a close look at how the serialization happens now. Um, so uh, we've implemented this as an extension of the reflection-based auto-serializer. Um, and uh, we, this can be enabled through the PDX configuration on the client side. So that's either through your client cache, uh, through the API directly, or even through Spring Data Gemfire. Um, the auto-serializer reflects on the Java classes that it's been, uh, that it's been uh, told to look at. <laughs> Uh, at runtime, this just normal behavior will build a metadata repository of all the types and their fields um, to share across the system. And so it's reading in all those classes and making the, uh, the reflected values and, and any annotations available as well. So uh, there are three extension methods that we handle in the reflection-based auto serializer. The first is transform field value. And that is just the opportunity for us to choose which fields we want to have special behavior for, and which ones we want default behavior for. Um, and then at runtime, we've got the right transform method. So that's if we want to transform the field value, this is what we actually do with it, and the read transform method on the other way, on the return path. We'll look at that code in a few minutes. But a quick preview of the code. Uh, the transform field value implementation we're seeing here. So all we do is we check to see if a given field has the annotation present for PII encryption. If it's there, we're going to do special handling for this, and otherwise, default. OK, let's look at uh, this visually. So the initialization steps, we bootstrap a Java JRE. And that has the JCE ciphers. And uh, we have this Spring Boot app, so that, uh, that uh, launches a Spring context. And here, we initialize our reflection-based auto serializer. So that reflects on the classes and builds up the PDX metadata repository, including our custom annotations. We've got the crypto service. So that obtains a key from the external source and instantiates your cipher. And we have a, a wrapper on the Geode Client API, um, probably similar to what a lot of you guys use in, in your own uh, Geode applications. And that's just a, uh, a wrapper around the various Geode API calls that we make, including connections and any reader writes. At runtime, OK. So we have the same keys, the same three components. Data op requests come in. Um, they get passed to the Geode API to either read or write, do a region.put, maybe do an OQL uh, query. Um, any of the custom objects in the write events get uh, 
passed under the PDX serialization layer, where they call the crypto service, and then the encrypted data gets passed into the, uh, into the geode cluster via the client connection pool. Very straightforward. <laughs> Um, so Narajan's going to take us through a uh, code and a code walkthrough and demo. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Niranjan Sarvi. Are you ready for code and demo? Yes. Great. Okay. Let me switch over to IDE. I have a data model which uh, represents a very generic customer order form. Can I zoom it, please? Sure. Can you see now? Uh, let me do that a little later. There we go. Nice. Is that fine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this data model has a personal information and uh, customer address and credit card details. So this model has uh, PII fields which are designated for encryption using annotation called uh, enable encryption. So these fields need to be encrypted and stored in a geode, right? So. Let us take a look at different components which are wired together to perform encryption. So the first component is the crypto service. This performs the actual encryption and decryption of the plain text, which implements Java JCE's advanced encryption that we can see here. And this implements uh, encrypt and decrypt method, which are called by other components, like the custom PDX serializer. This custom PDX serializer um, intercepts geodes uh, reads and writes. For all the annotated fields in the data model, it checks if the field is annotated for the write operation, it encrypts the data using the crypto service that we just looked at. During read operation, it decrypts the data from geode during read operation. So the next component is the geode data access service. This again, uh, this is very similar to your existing applications uh, service pattern, which implements um, pretty um, uh, reads and writes and other OQL queries, uh, very similar to your existing patterns. Um, in this case, the only difference is the registration of the custom PDX serializer that you can see on the line number 46. Uh, the rest all components like the client cache uh, region that it needs to write to and read from are all similar. The next component is the actual application. Uh, again, this is uh, very similar to your existing application that, uh, in this case, uh, this is the Spring Boot application. So here, like uh, normally we get data from the external form. Here I get the uh, plain object, and I use the geode data access service to, to put the data into a geode uh, uh, service, so using the access service. So in this code, it encrypts the data and puts the object into geode as an encrypted object. So to sum it up, um, for your existing applications, there is not much changes. However, you need to implement 
um, the custom serializer and the encryption algorithms, like, like we just looked at. So now, I have a few test cases. Uh, I will, we will just run through it, and we'll come back and explain. Okay, so these two were passed. In my first test case, here I create the plain customer object, which has all the feeds like PI data, uh, shipping address, and other credit card details, like you see here. Oh, sorry. So in line number 59, I call the uh, Geoda access service to put the data into Jumpfire. So in this case, it encrypts the data and puts into Geode. So in line number 60, I, I read the data. So in this case, it uh, decrypts the data. So the rest of the call check for the equality of the PII data, so which is passed in this case. So in the second test case, I create a plain object. I update the credit card, credit card numbers, and CV code. And I call the OQL query, which is select all the credit cards from the customer region where first name equals something. So in this case, the first name field is, is encrypted in Geode. So we need to pass in the encrypted field. So using the same service that we talked about earlier. So and the rest of the code is checks for if the credit cards are all equal, so which is also passed. So the test cases are, doesn't really you know, um, reveal anything. So now let us perform the reality check in in Geode by looking at the data using the GFISH interface. So I have the client code, which I'm going to run. So this will create a plain customer object and stores the encrypted data in Geode. So I'm going to grab the first ID, one of the IDs, and use the Geode interface, which is um, the interface that we can look at the objects in the Geode. So I have a query here, and I'm going to run this query to in inspect the data, the, the first name and the credit card number. So you can see here the data is encrypted, whereas the gender is not, because I enabled the first name and last name to be encrypted, so you can see that the data is really encrypted. So yeah, by this demo, I think you know, we can easily accomplish the encryption using the simple uh, enable encryption annotations. Great. So let's see where we are here. Okay, so this is actually all available on, uh, on our uh, Pivotal Data Engineering GitHub site. Um, and uh, I'm happy to see everyone's trying to get a snapshot of that. <laughs> I'll leave that up, actually. We, uh, that concludes our, our prepared slides and, and our uh, demo code walkthrough. Um, so we will leave some time for Q&A. Uh, if we have a little extra time, I'll mention um, some follow-up work we're doing. Uh, we've written a, a soon-to-be-published blog on how you would migrate some existing data um, from unencrypted to become encrypted with this pattern and achieve that with zero downtime. Um, so we're finding with different patterns that we implement that that's a challenge um, which often requires a different approach and uh, so we found one that we think is uh, powerful for this and, and maybe extension uh, later. So to give that as much time as possible, let's go straight to questions and answers. Um, 
Sure, go ahead. So uh, the question is, uh, do we have an example of how much overhead um, this creates compared to an unencrypted solution? Uh, and the answer is the PII fields themselves will tend to you know, be maybe 50 to 100% of their original size. Um, and uh, kind of the overall throughput or latency impacts are, are minimal, but um, you know, probably less than 10% in the tests we've done. Kind of, they, they correlate to the increase in the size of the object pretty directly. Exactly, yeah. So in, in terms of data size, you know, it adds like 10% of data size. And uh, CPU-wise, you know, we observed, you know, same thing. Like only during um, like mass encryption, like, you know, Gideon is going to talk about next. So we just see very tiny incremental steps there. So uh, yeah, the question is, uh, do we ha have we implemented anything for uh, the .NET or native client? And um, we haven't, although uh, the same pattern should be applicable in, a, in nearly the same way um, with, the, with, with the native client. There'd be a couple differences, probably. Uh, so you'd have to designate them. You know, I, I don't know how annotations might work in that, uh, but. Uh, Maybe some variants in that. Um, but you have the same extensibility available, um, certainly in PDX, and, and I believe in the auto serializer as well in the native client. So it should be pretty much a match. And the server wouldn't know the difference whether it's a Java or native client anyway. Right, Jeff, go ahead. Function. Uh, so, so yeah, the question was, um, given that the encryption and decryption all happens on the client, uh, would this have any impact to uh, logic implemented as functions? And I guess the answer to that would depend on whether um, you actually need access to un unencrypted data in that logic. So if you, if you don't, you can just treat it as a byte array the whole way through. You could copy that into other objects. Um, uh, you have pretty free hand within the context of the function execution to do anything except for decrypt. <laughs> um, now, you could, this could be extended in some ways to allow decryption to happen on the server cluster under certain conditions. We have not done it that way, uh, simply because out in the field when we discussed this with customers, that seemed to be kind of a hard requirement. So, no, 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 there can't be a way to decrypt this on the server. That would kind of undo a lot of, of the good that's, that's happening here. So um, we could probably dig into some more specific examples. But uh, I think for many use cases, it would be fine. For some, probably not. Mm -hmm. So let me repeat that, make sure I understand it correctly. So um, in your experience, you, you've been uh, working with some applications where uh, there's not a layer, I guess, between uh, where the JavaScript is managing the presentation and uh, business logic uh, is not handling POJOs. It's just handling those same data structures. Well, so if you're, uh, if you're not using ty uh, predefined types, this might be a challenge. Um, 
I know we have customers that uh, throw, kind of throw JSON right into PDX, and, um, and it has this proliferation of types that, that happens. Um, so certainly, you could use the similar pattern and access those encrypt to decrypt methods from other places within, within the application. Um, so it wouldn't have to be in, in PDX. This is kind of predicated on the idea that, uh, that you're managing your serialization through PDX and that we know that everything goes, almost everything goes through that layer. Um, that's where the simplicity that I keep describing comes from. Kind of you make this change in one place and now it handles it kind of everywhere. Um, so that might be more of a hit and miss if it's, if it's a less formal separation of data structures as, as you go through the stack, if you will. Um, but aspects of this would probably work fine, you know, as long as you can kind of get to that same spot to apply encryption um, before it gets pushed into the server uh, cluster. Uh, it would be pretty similar. Go ahead. Yeah. Key management, the, the serialization, uh, the, the key, who's responsible for the key management? The serializer example that you provided, do you have any key management examples? Yeah. Key rotation. Sure. Sure. Yeah. The question is uh, how do we manage keys, right? And also the key rotation, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, um, this is a really simple example, right? So, in reality, the keys are managed in the vault, uh, either in the HashiCorp vault or in the uh, CRUD hub. So, generally, they, they manage there. And also, this code that, it, that we mentioned, you know, it, you know, supports a little bit of key rotation, but uh, in reality, you know, um, you'll have to extend the existing code to maintain, uh, to support the key rotation things. Yes. In the back. So, uh, is there any plans to build some default implementations of the encrypted encryption methods or common encryption methods and enabling us to just pick and choose through, say, cache XML configuration or uh, app properties configuration? So, uh, the question is. Um, Could this become a configurable option um, that's productized, I think? So I think that's something we're exploring. Um, several people in this room could probably answer that better, better than I. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a lot more to think about in terms of a, a productized solution. Um, and I think we wouldn't want to force people to use the auto serializer, for example. Um, but it, I know it's getting a serious look right now. And uh, I'm hoping that is something we end up productizing and making e even easier to implement. But uh, until then, we make this available. And, uh, and uh, at least at this, for, for certain applications, I think it'll be very useful. Any other questions? Go ahead. Well, uh, so the question, the, the, the question was, um, do we lose any functionality by not being able to query with the original text? And um, uh, you, you know, we're limited to equality predicates. So if we take the premise that the server cluster cannot handle unencrypted personal information, then we certainly will not be able to do queries against unencrypted information. So that's, you know, that's something you have to accept. Um, I think we'll see that's much less of an issue if the PII is not something you need to search on directly. 
There are techniques that we could enhance here. We could apply tokenization techniques, I think, and, and that would help. Um, so this isn't exclusive of other, other patterns that could be applied. Um, although I should say that the uh, encryption itself, though, is deterministic, right? You have to know which key you're using, and therefore uh, it is deterministic. It's not like you can't be sure. Uh, uh, in fact, the, the data itself encodes the, the key version that you're using. So that's part of the metadata we carry with each, with each update. I think we're, um, we're past our time. <laughs> so before everyone goes, let me just uh, mention that if you're having issues with migrating data with, Je with Geode uh, and doing that without service downtime, that's something we're going to follow up with. Um, very shortly on a Pivotal blog. And we have some preview copies of that printed up right now. So if you'd like to come and get a copy of, uh, of uh, PDX PII encryption migration strategies, come on up and we'll hand them out. Yeah. Thank yeah, you very you. much. Mm -hmm.